Good morning. How's everybody doing today? This side's getting a little bit more people than this side. You guys on this side have to invite more people. Gotta balance it out. Maybe we need to do church like I used to do youth group, a competition. Whatever side brings more people gets the donuts. Or whatever it takes, right? What is it? We're fasting. I thought we were done fasting. You're going beyond 21 days? Praise God. Hey. The whole year? Oh, wow. So even though we're at the end of the 21 days, like today's the day after for some of us, and it's like, boom, stuff's happening, stress, drama, sound system's not working, this, that, and the other. So the enemy's going to do anything he can to distract, uh, take away from what he's been doing and what he's going to continue to do. And I said it in the app, right? Some of you have those answers to prayer, and I'm so excited for you. Some of you have seen movement to those answers to prayer, and some of you are like, Pastor Al, I haven't seen nothing. And I appreciate you being honest with me. But God's timing is not our timing. We don't know why things happen. Sometimes when you step out and you pray and you do more things, the enemy is going to attack even more. But don't let yourself be discouraged, amen? If you prayed for something, believe that God is going to answer it, amen? You got to believe it. So today, I want to challenge you. Are you ready to be challenged? Two people in the back are. It's a challenging message. So we're finishing up our series on dangerous prayers. Week number one, we prayed the prayer, make me bold. And some of you have told me how God has made you bold. And that's awesome. Leave, even as your pastor, I've been praying that prayer, make me bold. And you would think I, I'm like Superman and I have all this boldness and I don't. Even the other day, I was in the emergency room with someone, and they happened to be in the, the, the waiting room. I said, let's have church right here. Laid hands on them, prayed. When I was done walking out, all these people were looking at me. I should have been like Silvino and just prayed for everybody. Pastor Erica said, you should have just been like, Jesus. Right? But it takes boldness to pray in front of people. The other day, I was at Planet Fitness. Someone needed prayer. Stopped right there, laid hands on them, prayed. Right? So even as your pastor, I'm praying, make me bold. Then last week we prayed, Lord, speak to me. Pause. Listen to God. Because if we're doing all the talking, we can't hear what he wants to say to us. And God's a communicative, personal God, and he wants to communicate with you. If you thought those two prayers were tough, this one's rough. The prayer that we're going to look at today is a tough one. It's going to invite you to have courage that you've never had before. It may be the most dangerous prayer that I have ever prayed. Some of you will refuse to pray it. Some of you will say, absolutely not. But I pray that you'll at least have an open mind to hear this this morning. It's not a common prayer. It's not a usual prayer. It's not a safe prayer. And it, it's not consistent with today's church in America that wants to just tickle your ears and wants to just preach the name it, claim it, blessings from above, God has stuff in store for you. Yes, I believe all that. But I also believe we need to preach messages that are going to challenge you, prick your heart, and you're going to not say amen, but you're going to be like, ouch. Quiet. I like to say easy prayers. I like easiness in my life. I like to pray, God, keep me safe, because I want to be safe. I want to say, God, bless my day, because I want to have a good day. I want God to bless whatever food we eat after church today, because we're done with praying and fasting. Well, we're not done with praying. We're done with fasting. So I want to pray, God, help me have a nice day. Because truly and honestly, I don't like to be inconvenienced either. I don't want to have interruptions and challenges. I want to pray that when I wake up in the morning, I have a nice day. I get all the green lights on the way to Planet Fitness. That when I say thank you to someone, they say you're welcome. When I open the door, they say thank you. And that on Sunday mornings, I don't have pimples on my nose. Those are the kind of prayers I want to pray because they're safe prayers. Listen, I'm just being real with you. This prayer we're talking about is not safe. 
It's one of the most dangerous prayers. And if you pray this prayer, God will answer it. And you might find yourself frustrated. You will become more uncomfortable. Life may become harder. Chances are it won't get easier for you. I want to invite you to pray this dangerous prayer because I believe following Jesus was never meant to be safe. The prayer that we're going to pray this week is, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Break my heart. Wreck me. Show me what makes you grieve, God. Let me see people through your eyes. If you pray this prayer, you might lose sleep. Your heart might burn with righteous anger. You might find yourself doing things that other people really don't understand. You might find spiritual resistance, opposition, criticism, and even persecution. And in all your pain, your discomfort, and your agony, you still can find joy. And you will be blessed as your heart breaks over something that breaks the heart of our God. Break my heart, O oh God. Today I want to look at the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had an unfortunate nickname. He's known as the weeping prophet. And I like nicknames, but I hope I'll never be called the weeping pastor. He was the weeping prophet because his heart was breaking over the troubles of the people of God, and it broke his heart. The context of Jeremiah, the people of Judea were rebelling against God. They were widespread, complete rebellion. The leaders were abusing the widows. They were taking advantage of those that were poor. And if you can even believe it, they were sacrificing babies and little children to false gods. His heart was breaking when he saw the people that claimed to love God acting this way. And you can see it in Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 and 21, when the prophet says this, my grief is beyond healing, my heart is broken. I hurt with the hurt of my people, I mourn and I'm overcome with grief. Jeremiah did what he knew to do when he felt this way, and he preached a fiery sermon and he preached some of the most fiery sermons. If you've never read through the book of Jeremiah, especially if you're in school for ministry, he was a fiery preacher. When he preached, the fire came down. Not quite like Elijah, but he preached with fire. So he preached, he prayed, he fasted, just like we did. He fasted to pray for this situation, and nothing changed. And he was frustrated, and his heart was broken. And he said, my grief is unbearable, my heart is broken. Question for you this morning. Do you even want anything like that in your life? When I wake up, I want the opposite. I don't want anyone to flip me off. I don't want anyone to be rude. I want people to be nice. I don't want any problems, heartache, or grief. But that's why when we pray it, it's a dangerous prayer. Break my heart. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual interest or small things that annoy you or when you're driving on towards Planet Fitness and the homeless guy's on the side of the road asking for money and, oh, I always feel so moved, Pastor Ralph, so I give him my loose change. Hey, that's great. You did something that makes you feel better. That's not the type of heartache I'm talking about. If it was for that type of situation, God would break your heart so much that you'd give everything you have to this person, you'd bring them to church, you'd start a 501c3 just for the, the homeless in our city. I'm not talking about just giving pennies and stuff like that. I'm talking about a deeper thing in your heart. It's not a bad thing, but what I'm talking about is more of a gut-wrenching burden that consumes you. It doesn't let up, it doesn't go away, it gnaws at you and consumes you until you simply cannot not act. I know there's too many knots in there, but you know what I'm saying. You have to do something because the pain inside of you is building up. And I know some of you have some of this passion because you're often saying, what are we doing for the homeless this year? When can we go out and give hot cocoa or, or blankets? 
So some of you have some of this stirring in your heart. You must do something because the pain is burning inside of you. When you get to this place, the feeling that you have on behalf of God is the opposite of everything in popular culture today. It's the very opposite of the feel-good version of Christianity. God exists for you. God exists to make my life better, to take away my pain, to fill me with blessings. Yes, all of that is true. But what if God's greatest blessings come from God's greatest breakings? What if God's greatest blessings come from the greatest breakings in your life? What would happen if God really broke your heart for the things that break his? What if God blesses you with a heavenly burden, a divine burden, a holy hurt? I don't know about you, but I like comfort. Some of you like to go camping. I like to go to a hotel. And I don't like to go just to a little dive hotel. I like the five-star hotels with room service, a hot tub, a sauna, a pool in your room. No, we've never stayed there. But we see it on the Discovery Channel. But a lot of you like other things, but I like comfort. But the problem is, comfort never once moved me to action. Comfort never once said, you know what, I gotta do something. I'm so comfortable, I gotta do something. Usually it's the opposite, right? I don't like pain. I don't like pain, I like pain-free days, but pain-free days never made me more like Christ. What does pain do? Pain purifies, suffering strengthens, and trials actually make you more like Jesus because we have to depend on God. Break my heart for what breaks yours. It's a dangerous prayer. It snaps us out of our self-centered pursuit of comfort. Break my heart. And we see it in Moses and different people in the Bible. Moses saw all the heartache of the people he loved and lived with being abused over and over again until one time he just snapped and he carried that burden in his heart for decades until finally he stood before the greatest man in the world and said, let my people go. David, the little shepherd boy, the same exact thing. His dad kind of dismissed him and said, bring the cheese and crackers to the front line to the real men. And when he got there, the battle was on pause because of a guy named Goliath. And everybody else was intimidated, but David wasn't. And then the guy, Goliath, made a mistake and started making fun of God. And David goes, how are we going to let this guy make fun of God? And David said, everyone says you're too big to defeat. I say you're too big to miss. Give me a slingshot and give me a rock. And he wanted to kill the giant. His heart broke. Nehemiah in the Old Testament had a relatively comfortable job, a comfortable life. He had to taste test wine for the king to make sure it wasn't poisonous. So on the days that it wasn't poisonous, it was a good day for him, right? But he got a message that his people were suffering and and the city was falling apart and their, their lives were at risk. So he asked his king, can I go with to help, to do something, to be the general contractor, to get something going? So he risked his life and he went. And then he went and had this miraculous plan. He raised up the people because his heart was broken. He said, fight for your families, fight for your homes, fight for your wives, your husbands, your sons, your daughters. His heart was broken and it moved him out of comfort into action. Jesus, while seeing the people and the multitudes, he wept because his heart was broken. And what did that lead him to do but to give his life for you and I? Then there's the New Testament theologian, Popeye the Sailor Man. Some of you young kids don't know who that is. I don't know if it's Gen X or before we'll know. Popeye the Sailor Man lives in a garbage can. Anybody? All right. Well, he had a babe of a girl named Olive Oil. And when Brutus would mess with Olive Oil, Popeye would get so upset, he would say, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. And pow! 
If you pray this prayer, you're going to get to a point where you say, I can't stand anymore. God, what can I do? And you're going to be moved to action. So don't pray this prayer if you want to just sit and be comfortable. Pray this prayer if you want God to use you like never before. He will stir a, stir a divine burden inside of you. And you'll say, that's all I can stand. Break my heart, God. When you pray this prayer, get ready to ache, get ready to hurt, and I don't know what will break your heart. It might be the plight of the unborn babies. It might be for our children in our community that can't read. It might be for racial injustice that haunts so many people. It might be to get clean drinking water to people that don't have it. It might be for those who are trapped in financial bondage. It might be for children in our state that don't have a loving home. It might be for those who are suffering from mental illness. It might be for those that are trapped in addiction and don't know how to get out. It might be for those that are recovering from infidelity and unfaithfulness in marriage and don't know if they can ever love or trust again. It might be for teens that are cutting or living daily in depression and don't have good parental influences. Or it could be for those that are addicted to pornography and the ways of, of God that aren't of God. It could be like my good friend at Gates of Hope Faith. She had a heartache for people that didn't have food, that didn't have ways to even get food. Not only did she start a food pantry, she started a mobile food pantry. You think we have a hard time with our food pantry. She puts it all in a truck every week and drives to the high rises. Sets it up, tears it down with usually a volunteer of like three people. She had such a burden that broke her heart that she's still fighting City Hall literally to keep her place or to find a new place. But she's not going to give up because something drives her from within. Break my heart, God. And I know all of you won't pray it. I'm guessing a majority of you will not pray it. But if we want to be a church that changes the world by loving God and loving people, part of loving people is praying this prayer. Break my heart, God, for what breaks yours. Let me see people like you see people. You can do a self-assessment right now, and I hope I get this right in my head because it's not in my notes, but if you're driving down the road and you see a homeless person or somebody that's you see this all the time, right, in, in Fall River where they're just nodding off like this. I see it all the time. And if your first gut response is, oh, what a bum, what a loser, whatever, you don't see people like God sees people. But if your heart breaks and you start to cry and you want to pull over to help them, if you want to just say, hey, let me get you some water, let me get you some coffee, then you start to see people like God sees people. Yes, we all need to be safe. I get it. Not everybody can do that. But your first gut reaction to when you see these people will show you where you are in your walk with God. If you see the person asking for money, get a job, you bum. Nobody would ever say that at our church. But your first initial reaction, I pray even in a little impiquito way, Today, you would say, God, let me see people like you see people. Because you know what? God would pull his car over, he'd get out, and he'd hug that person that's nodding off. He would hug that person that's asking for money. He'd bring them across the street to Burger King and feed them. Break my heart for what breaks yours. A lot of people would say it's better not to get involved. It's better just to ignore it. If I look straight and don't make eye contact, it's okay. Listen, I get to that light sometimes that I don't have anything to give to the person. And it's awkward, especially when they come right up to your window. So I roll it down. Hey, what's going on? Hey, have you heard of the Tomeo Center? It's down on Bay Street. They can help you out. I don't have anything, but can I, I'm going to Starbucks right now. Why am I going to spend $8.50 on Starbucks and not offer this guy a coffee? So can I get you a coffee? And then he gives me this long list. I'd like a double latte. You know, this guy knows what he's doing. But the point is you love him like God would love him. I know you won't pray this prayer, but we need to. It's not easy. And some of you would say it's easier not to care. It's better not to hurt. It's better to not get involved. 
But I hope you'll understand this. It's better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. It's better to hurt with a purpose than to go through life and exist without a purpose. You thank God when he moves you. You thank God when he calls you. You thank God when he breaks your half on behalf of him. The apostle Paul was like this in the New Testament. He was kind of what you would call a false convert. He was religious, but he didn't know Christ. He didn't have a personal relationship with him, so he bragged on his own experiences. He bragged all his religious attributes. He said in Philippians 3, I was circumcised on the eighth day, look at me. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I follow all the laws, all 613 laws. Look at me. I led a very righteous life. But when he became to know Christ, not religion, not rules, but when he had a relationship, what he said is this, I consider all of that stuff loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing God. It's a loss, it's nothing, it's garbage. The Greek word for loss is actually dung, D-U-N-G. You would say poopy. He was saying all of the stuff that I used to do, I consider poop compared to the relationship I have in Christ. And that's why he said in Romans 9, one through three, the following. With Christ is my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit can confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if it would save them. Would you ever say, I'll trade my spot in heaven for somebody in my church? He was so convinced, his heart was so broken, this wrecked me, because I love you people, but I don't know if I'd give up my spot in heaven for you. I wanna, I'm being transparent. I wanna get to that place, but he was so convinced, his heart was so broken that he was willing to give up his life in heaven for his Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, I don't think God, our God is like that. I think God might test us to see if we'll really do it, but I think he'd be like, ah, psych, you're both coming to heaven now, right? Because I don't think God is a vindictive God. He says, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief. My heart is broken, the very thing that breaks the heart of God. He says, I would be willing to be cursed and cut off if it would save them. This is how much I love them. Listen, it's a dangerous prayer. When you pray it, your heart will break. You may hurt, and you might hurt alone. People look on the outside of my life and say, oh, Pastor Rob, you look like you have a great life. And I do. I got a great wife. We kiss a lot. I have great friends. I have a good support network. I pastor the greatest church in Fall River on Rock Street, on Rock Street, at 414 Rock Street, because I don't want to, I love Pastor Andy down the street. But can I, can I be honest? I, I, I try to put on a happy face all the time, but sometimes I'm just miserable, because my heart breaks. My heart breaks so much as I walk through these pews and pray for all of you. I sit in the pew and I'm like, God, I know the person sitting here. They, they need more of you, God, if they would just repent and be saved. Listen, yes, I judge you. But it's what the Spirit puts in my heart. Because I know some of you are choosing to stay in the bondage and just ask for forgiveness and come to church on Sunday. My heart breaks because some of you are so bound in religiousness that you think that's the goal to get you into heaven, and it's not. It's relationship with God. My heart breaks because my calling is to get as many people into heaven as possible by relationship, not religion. So my heart breaks. My heart breaks for some of you. 
And I pray, and I pray, and I pray, and I pray. But sometimes inside, I have that holy hurt because I love each of you. And when you hurt, your pastor hurts. And when you're far from God, your pastor hurts. And your pastor prays. And your pastor will never give up on you. But inside, that's the holy hurt I carry is for my people. My heart breaks. You may pray this prayer. He will have your heart break for your own sin. See, we talk about love God, love people, change the world. If you skip the love God part with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and you go right to love people, and you decide to pray this prayer this morning, God, break my heart. If you're not in right relationship with him, guess what the first thing he might do? Show you how his heart breaks for you because of the sin that you're trapped in, the relationship you shouldn't be in, whatever it is. And my prayer is that he breaks your heart so much that you realize, I need to knock it off. I need to get my life right. So you can pray the prayer, but if you're not walking in right relationship, he's gonna show you what's wrong in you. And guess what? He's loving and gracious, and he'll be like, my child, I forgive you. I love you. Just knock it off. Break my heart for what breaks yours. David, a man in the Old Testament, the guy with the slingshot, he could write a book, How to Do the Seven and Still Get to Heaven. Because he broke every commandment, he broke every sin. He was the chief of sinner well before Paul was. And yet he was known as a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he'd get knocked down, but he'd get up again in the power of the Holy Spirit. And after he messed up with Bathsheba, he said in Psalm 51, 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit broken and contrite heart for you. God, will you not despise me? This morning, if you go before God and you confess your sins, he forgives you just like that. You don't have to do a bunch of stuff to come to him. You just have to ask him for forgiveness and then say, from today forward, I'm gonna live for you. And it won't be easy. But guess what? You'll be part of the family of God and we will walk with you. You'll have a pastor that'll walk with you. And if you choose to reject him today, I'll still walk with you. I'll still answer your phone call, your text messages and sit with you. I won't push you, I'll push you a little bit. But in God's time, and I pray it's today because you never know tomorrow is guaranteed. Break my heart. Because if you ask God to break your heart, you'll be driven by a higher calling, a heavenly purpose, not just to pursue your own selfish lusts and desires, but to reflect the glory of God whose heart your heart is breaking for. When he breaks your heart, thank him. Thank him for doing it. Thank him that he is giving you that heartbreak on behalf of him. Because when you pray this dangerous prayer, and it is dangerous, he'll wreck you, but I promise you, it is so much better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Father God, as we come to you this morning in prayer, that the power of your spirit would work and manifest today in the hearts of the people that are here and listening online. We pray right now that your spirit would convict, your spirit would love, and your spirit would have genuine transformation this morning. Lord, for those that want to pray this prayer, I pray that you'll answer their prayers this morning, that you'll give them a holy vision. Lord, that maybe they'll catch the vision of loving God, loving people, changing the world like never before because they now see the people of Fall River through your eyes. Lord, break our hearts this morning. Lord, for those here that aren't in right relationship with you, 
I pray that they'll realize that sin is sin. If it was wrong when you wrote it, it's wrong today, God. I pray that they would realize that they need to confess their sins, change their lifestyle, and come to you. And those that are struggling with that this morning, I pray that you'll convict, you'll work, you'll move, Lord, in a powerful and mighty way. Lord, I thank you for being here this morning. I pray that you'll bless each person here. Those that pray that prayer, Lord, walk with them through this process, God. Lord, those that need you today, I pray they'll just ask Jesus, come into my life, change my heart, make me new, and today I'll live for you for the rest of my life. It's as simple as that. Those that are far from you and haven't really, have been playing the game, Lord, I pray that they'll come back to you and recommit their lives this morning. For the rest of us, God, I pray that you'll challenge us in different ways this week to be bold, to be still, or to pray, break my heart, God. Lord, I pray that you'll be with our people, bless their socks off above and beyond what they could ever imagine. Be with our Portuguese service coming up next. Be with our business meeting tonight and our midweek services this week, God. Thank you for what you're doing at Christ the Rock. In Jesus' name, amen. This pastor loves you. If you need prayer, you want to talk, I'll be up here. Other than that, I hope to see you tonight. God bless.